this computer. Share screen here. All right, still good. Everybody sees the picture. Slides. Yay. Yay. Okay. Feel like I'm the, the governor today. I have to tell you where I got my mask. Got my mask today from a uh, friend on the board of the directors of ASCLS, and it says uh, Heroes in Lab Coats. And it's got uh, hearts and urine cups and test tubes and our little ASCLS symbol. Can you order them? I don't know where she got it. It's, uh, I can ask her. Um, it's actually a, a friend from Iowa, from Region 5. She's on the board of directors with me since, since day one. I think this is her last year and I have one more year. All right, so today we have Staphylococci, Staphylococci, Staphylococciae, and we'll get that word out as the family of all these staffs. Um, downstairs, you're, you've got uh, uh, two staffs, okay? So you want to make sure you look at your partner's plate and look at it. You're going to have a blood auger and a chocolate plate. On, on, you're going to have four plates on each table. And I'm hoping that you get a sense that what it looks like, okay? Because remember our number one goal was to when we get to the lab that all we need to do is look at the plate that's growing after a day and we can we already know what we're looking for. So there's, you know, we, we want to be ahead of the ID. We never want to be at the ID stage waiting on a computer to tell us what we have. We should have a very good idea ahead of time, okay? So that we use the ID method as confirmation because we've already decided with the test, we have some tests we're going to do today downstairs that will help us guide us down this family tree. Okay, so when we start with staff, you know, next week it's strep. Okay, so we're going to, we'll be talking about how we determine how we go from that start of the culture and how we branch off from staff to strep. That's what we're looking at. So you're branching tree for microbiology will get bigger and bigger and bigger based on what your culture is doing at the beginning. Okay, so all of our plates we're going to be introducing week after week. You got to kind of put it together. We can't just forget about it, what we're doing downstairs today and Thursday with staff. We can't forget about that next week when we're on strep because we're going to talk about how strep is determined based on some tests too. So that being said, we'll start with our Staphylococciae, and we're going to see some names. So we're in the genus Staphylococciae, and we have our species of Staphylococcus aureus. And then this is always bothersome for a new micro student. I don't know how much intro you got, but if you're not familiar with these names, right, and somebody gives you a list of organisms and they have S in front of them, and Epidermidus. Some of you might just say, well, that, that could be strep, right? We don't know what the S is. So that, I know that's a problem. So you've got to uh, overcome it. So sometimes I will leave it as staph abbreviated. And that helps me. I don't ever leave it with S and then something. If I'm writing it out in shorthand, I always give it a staph aureus or staph epi, a staph saprophyticus. I will put the staph in so that whoever comes behind me is not looking for, well, is that a, I can't remember. I had this class so long ago, I can't remember if that's a streptococcus or if it's a staphylococcus. I don't, I don't know what we're doing with the S, right? So to give you that fair warning, but that is shorthand for staff today. So if you see the S up there by itself, feel confident you'll go with uh, staphylococcus. There's other staffs that we have Okay, other species are coagulase negative staph. So um, what we'll see is we have some coagulase positive, and that's uh, one of the tests we're going to be doing today downstairs is a coagulase test. Okay. And we'll get into that shortly. 
So our general characteristics of Staphylococcus is that it, in the microscope, we will see gram-positive cocci. 0.5 to 1.5 micrometers in diameter, so that's the size. You've already seen that, right? On the gram stain. We saw that size under the microscope at 40x or 1,000x. They're usually arranged singly, singularly, what should I say? Pairs or clusters. So clusters always comes with the staph, because in Greek, staphla means cluster, grapes. Okay, so in coccus means berry, so we have a cluster of grapes, berries. One look at. So ground positive always makes fun, right, for staph because it turns the cluster into purple grapes, right? Some of you had red grapes the other day, remember, those that didn't do that. And I try to say, don't, don't worry so much that you're getting red grapes today because whatever reason, you didn't get enough purple color in or you decolorize a little too much. But red grapes does not mean pink, right? Or lighter red or negative, right? So that was the problem. So next time we do a gram stain, we'll see it a little better. We should get a better result. But I did, I did use some other student slides and let the, those students that had red grapes see that there were purple, should have been purple grapes. That's our general characteristics. Clusters, if you're following along the study guide, it is uh, the cluster fill in there, first fill in of the arrangement, singly pairs or clusters. So we have this uh, catalase. Catalase we will do downstairs today. Uh, Staphylococcus is catalase positive. Okay, so you're going to get a little vial of catalase, right? You're going to pop it and you're going to put it on. You're going to spear a little bit of your staph on a glass slide and you're going to put catalase on top of it and you will see a reaction, okay? So what that is, is catalase is produced, okay? So this is a catalase producing organism and what that does is prevents um, hydrogen peroxide from um, killing the bacteria okay so it's a defense mechanism for staph so staph has a way to prevent hydrogen peroxide which we those that were in immunology yesterday which is not everybody but immunology yesterday we talked about hydrogen peroxide being inside the cell as a way of a neutrophil killing the organism, right? Well, gram positive have a defense for that. They like to produce catalase that neutralizes the hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so this is how when we get to uh, our strep lecture, right, which is coming, this is one of our biggest ways of determining our branch and staff and strep. Okay, is catalase. So all the staffs go in the catalase positive direction. And if we were worried if it's a strep or not, that we do catalase test and that would be on the, on the strep side if it was a negative for catalase. So again, this is being produced by the staphylococcus bacteria and it's a defense mechanism to hydrogen peroxide. Most strains of straph can be are halo tolerant, which means they can grow in high concentrations of salt, which is sodium chloride. Okay, and we're going to see that we're, we're actually going to have a um, plate called mannitol salt. We'll see pictures of in a minute. Atmospheric requirements staph are facultative anaerobes. This is a big word for us, big two words. Okay. Facultative, anaerobe, that defined, okay, anaerobe, we kind of know, right? We have anaerobic, aerobic, right? Dealing with oxygen, are we at least there? We at least have that part. We're good with that, okay? But facultative kind of changes the narrative a little bit. So these are organisms which grow well anaerobically, but better when oxygen is present, okay? So they're kind of a, you know, Weaking a little bit. They're not anaerobic, period, which means they can only grow without oxygen, right? They're facultative, which means they 
can grow anaerobically, but they grow better when you put them in an oxygen environment. Facultative anaerobe. I know you're like, oh my gosh. And we're going to see those, those turn, we'll see different ways. Does anybody know what's what's the other word? We got facultative anaerobes. What's what's the word I'm looking for? that you should have gotten an intro to micro where they put a different word in front of anaerobe there. Do you remember what that was? What if that you could only grow with without oxygen? What word would we take out? What word would we place in for facultative? Oh, somebody got to remember intro sometime. <laughs> Intro, intro, strict, anaerobe, what's, what's word mean strict, micro term, okay, maybe we'll see it later, be thinking, I'm going to give you time to, I know it's early in the semester, and gosh, intro was like a week ago, right, but think about it, all right. Hopefully we'll get the answer before too long. All right, so here's our great gram positive staphylococcus. Uh, we said, hey, they could be single, single. They could be pairs. They could be clusters, right? So this is what usually this occurs when we when we apply. When we put this on the slide to put our organism on there, and we we disrupt, you know, the colonies themselves. We scatter this, okay? So this is usually our doing. So this may or may not be a diplo coxi, okay? We just have to see what's the majority, but usually what we'll see is if it's not, if it's three over here, three over here, and then there's a pair, that may not be a strict diplo coxi. Okay? So beware when you're looking at a gram stain, it may be a little bit deceiving at first, as to what you really have. So you kind of need to get a whole picture of the whole slide because you know this was one organism that you picked off. You picked off one colony from your growth media and you put it on your slide, you gram stained it, and you see that you got clusters, you got three, three, you know, there's no triplicate, it's always just diplo. So that's probably not a true diplococci organism. So if you looked at it and you go, oh my gosh, everything's paired up even the clusters paired up, and I can see that, then that would be your diplococci. But this is our classic, just staff, grouped up. This is a great picture here of showing it under electron micrograph, showing it does, or we can color it just like grapes, okay? And that color's probably put on there by, on purpose, not that they look like that. So if anybody has the answer in, in Zoom land, feel free to interrupt us and give us the answer to the strict anaerobe. Is it obligate? Yes. Uh, y'all already knew that. Why didn't y'all say that earlier? Y'all knew that. Yes. Who said that? Who's unmuted over there? Or does it come from here or up there? Thank you, Lori. Oh, good. All right, Lori. Give yourself a hand. That's it. Yes, obligate versus facultative. Good. All right. So y'all did get something out of intro. Snaphylococcus species, they colonize specific areas of the body. Okay? So as you keep seeing, you keep seeing number one right here, right? And hopefully you're taking in Staph aureus is our key Staphylococcus that we have to worry about in, in the hospital. Right? It is the one. As we know that this one, you know, it started out getting it, what, associated with hospitals. We used to call them um, hospital acquired. I'm looking for that word. What is that? What's the word for hospital acquired infection? Nosocomial. Nosocomial. Good. Nosocomial infection. That's why, that was the only time we ever heard of staff art. It was always, oh, you're, only, you're never going to have staph aureus unless you go to the hospital. 
That's where it lives. That's where it harbors. You can't get rid of it. You're going to end up getting it if you go into surgery. That's the only place you'll see it. What about today? How are we doing with that? Not too good, are we? You can see staff in the ER today, right? You can see staff in here, staff artists today in here. Um, if you work in healthcare long enough, you may be a carrier of staph aureus up here, right, through your nasal. And that's what we worry most about with healthcare workers is that if I'm working in wound care, if I'm working in a nursing home, and I'm not very good with hand hygiene, and I'm not very good about wearing my gloves, I can pretty much take a staph and spread it through the whole nursing home, okay? And we see that. We see that from small nursing home that I worked with. You know, every every wound culture that came from the nursing home was staff artists. It was just somebody in that workforce over there that was dealing with the wound care was cross-contaminating from one patient to the next. Okay, so they were probably carrying it in on them, either in their nasal, okay, but it was getting on their hands. They weren't doing good hand hygiene, and they were spreading it to the other patients. So our anterior nares, right, is a good source for finding Staphylococcus aureus. 20 to 40 percent of the general population serve as carriers, almost half, and the other. Then we have almost 90 percent individuals associated with hospitals. That would be hospital us personnel carry the organism. 50 percent of all doctors carry it, 70% of all nurses carry it, and this one's that ward attendant, right? So why is the ward attendant carrying it? Why is it 90% on the ward attendant? I mean, yeah, who's worked in a hospital? What is that? Hmm? So who takes care of the patient? Mostly techs. Techs or ward attendants? I mean, that's that's it, right? This is the most patient care down here, right? So does this, this person have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a doctorate degree? Not that you have to have one of those to be very good about cleaning your hands after you touch patients or put on your PPE. So once you're a carrier, you're a carrier always? I'm gonna say no, because we, we did that on us, right? So we were curious in the lab one day that we, you know, we were told that what happened, this, this is a good story. What happened was, is we wanted to isolate the nursing home patient. We, we, every wound we were getting was staph, or it was actually MRSA, it was methicillin resistant. We'll get to that in a minute. But MRSA was this key staph aureus, that's the one we don't like. And we decided that we would like to, we were calling over the nursing home and going, hey, you need to isolate Mr. Smith, he's got MRSA. And they did that for a little while, but then they called back one day and said, we don't isolate over here. You can instruct us to do that, but we don't do that because we're a long-term care facility and those rules don't apply. We have to treat the patient like they're at home. So we can't isolate them like you would in the hospital, but if they do come over to the hospital, then you can isolate them. That made no sense whatsoever, but that's what we were told. So we were curious, so we went ahead and did a nasal swab on all of us and streaked it out and grew it out that day. And we all have staph aureus, all of us, right? So after a while, after that in fact, kind of a, you know, outbreak of MRSA when it kind of went away, we swabbed again and we were negative. So I would have to say, yes, eventually you could be a carrier, but I think you can get over being a carrier. I, I don't think as long as you get away from it, um, but we, Good questions, but that's what we found. We found that you're not, once a carrier, not always a carrier. But yes, if you wanted to try it out, we could swab your nose and we could plate it, plate it on the plate, and we could see if you were carrying your staff artists. What does it do for you if you have it? Like nothing. You're, you're, most people that are carrying it are not affected by it. So it carries in the nasal nasal area. So if I'm sneezing or coughing and basically sneezing, right? And that projection, like I got my shield up today, so you're not having to worry. But that, that projection is could be a dose of staph aureus, 
or if you get it on your hands, wiping your nose, right? Your nose is running and you don't like Kleenexes, you just go ahead and get it the old wipe with the hand, right? And you see that all the time, right? We see, especially if you watch press conferences now, what do you see? If you watch press conferences enough, you see the person that's speaking touch their nose, grab their nose, grab their nose, wipe their nose, and it's just happy, you know, it's just like, but that's, now it's here. And they go, well, let me shake your hand before I leave. All right, it's great to meet you, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, well, that's staff artist, or it could be, right? <laughs> and then your next next person and the doorknob and the controller and all, you know. So that's how it just moves. So you see it from time to time. There have been outbreak in school. It'll be a staff outbreak. They'll say, hey, we got staff. We're going to shut down the school. You know, not now. We're going to shut it down for COVID now and clean. But, but staff used to be the closer of the school, too. We're going to have a staph infection somewhere in the school population. We're going to shut it down. We're going to wipe everything down with bleach. And then y'all can come back. Okay? That's usually how it goes. Staph is deadly. Every once in a while, you'll hear a story of somebody. I think the last one I heard was a football player. Right? Had a breakout or a wrestler. So all this, you know, body to body contact. Somebody's got staph on them you know, they're cut or wound or scrape or scratch, you roll around with that person for a while and your wound gets infected and it can go to deadly. I mean, it can move that quick. So it is serious. It's not something we lack. Like if somebody gets a staph infection, it needs to be treated. But it, it can be a bad thing too, really bad. Now they got you scared about your lab today. There is staph artists in your lab today. Okay, it's not MRSA, I don't think. I think I'm brought out just regular old staff artist, but staff artist is down there. So again, be be cautious of how you're handling it, what you, where you're touching, what you're where it's going. Keep it covered up. Is that what infantigo is? It, infantigo can be different different things. It's just that's it just can be caused by that though. It can be staff. It can be strep too though. So there's different things that can get under in that. Impetigo is just skin infection, black, turning black, but it can be strep too. So mainly strep is what we see. And that's just from scratches, mosquito bite or something. We're going to see that though. It's coming in strep like strep. Okay. The other one downstairs is a staph epidermis. Okay, so this is the common uh, skin staph that if we just had you, you know, culture your skin, it's a normal flora, okay? So we'll have that one down there too. So we see it on the moist areas of the body, um, but we usually consider staph epi as our, our normal flora. And then y'all done blood cultures, right? Everybody's drawing blood cultures and downstairs for principles, lobotomy, yeah. That, that's the one we worry most about with blood cultures is getting that one in the bottles because that's not really what we want. But a lot, you know, not a lot, but this, this could be your source of contamination on blood culture draw. The reason you have to scrub it down, the reason you have to put fluorohexidine on that and all that good stuff before you stick. And the reason, if, the reason why if you miss, then you got to start all over because you just introduced the skin to that side of it. Another one is saprophyticus. Uh, usually we see that with urinary tract infections. I didn't set this one up. Okay, so we're just going to go here. We've got these two players. So we got 10 plates downstairs, one through 10. Okay, so some of you have staph artists, some of you have staph epidermis. And you'll know when you get down there and you start looking at them. Because uh, we're going to tell you some features of this one that this one doesn't have. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so um, when you're looking at urine under the microscope, like, yep. and you see rods, so you can also see the coxa. Yeah, rods are usually easier to see, yeah. Yeah, okay. Right, and, and that's just because usually if somebody, I just put this up, when somebody has a, a rip-roaring E. coli urinary tract infection, you know. I mean, you can, it's just, you can tell that's a gram negative rod. You think it's probably E. coli, but there's plenty of them. With a staph, you don't really know if that's skin 
came through the epithelial lining, something like that. So it would be harder to say, oh yeah, that's going to be, you know, it could be a lot of staph epi in there too from skin, especially for sloughing, sloughing skin. Not that y'all know what that is yet, so. So we have some other coagulase negative staph. So who's our, who's coagulase positive? Did we hit on that yet? I don't know if we've hit on that. I think it seems like I've missed that somewhere. Coagulase positive. Well, we, I think it's coming, but we're kind of jumping ahead calling them. The other coagulase staphs are found on the skin, that's epidermis and saprophyticus. So guess who's coagulase positive? Y'all want to guess? Who's guessing? Which staph that we've talked about so far is coagulase positive? Staph aureus. Staph aureus, right? Okay, so that's going to be one of the things that we can determine today as to who's staph. Well, we're going to do a little immuno um, slide test today. We're going to put some latex antibody looking for coagulase. All right, so what you're gonna find downstairs, you're gonna find uh, media, okay? Let me get, uh, oh, here we are. Gosh, we're not very far. Um, Grove media, uh, we had those that are containing peptone, and that's TSA, and that's one, of the, you're gonna see triptych, triptych soy auger today, TSA, with sheep blood, okay? So we'll add some blood auger. We also have one called brain heart fusion auger. You won't see that one today. And what we're doing is, is that the selective media can be used to grow staph from body areas colonized by other microbes. So we're going to go through a little, little differential for media. What, what is our pattern of growth for staph? And this is, this is the group that we're looking at. And I know you're probably, I don't know how much, Growth media, did y'all get an intro? Any? Have you ever heard of brain heart infusion? Have you ever heard of triptych soy auger? Have you ever heard of PEA, amino ethyl alcohol auger? Yeah or not? Yes. Yes, on PEA? But not the other two. Okay. So we, right now, we're, we're pulled, we've pulled out a blood. TS, TSA, triptych soy auger, blood plate, and a chocolate auger. That's what you're going to have downstairs, those two names. But we could have pulled out a PEA. We have some, okay? But PEA right now, when we're, we're dealing with staph, it's not useful right now because we know we got staph. We know it's going to grow. Where staph, this would inhibit other gram-positive bacteria from growing, okay? Other gram-positive. So if you did a PEA plate, okay, the, the only PEA, when you use PEA, staph grows on PEA. Well, you know, we usually have staph epi, it grows too on PEA. So this would just be other gram-positive bacteria that are prohibited from growing. We have CNA auger, which is a little bit more fancy, okay? Glycine maledixic acid auger inhibits gram negative organisms, but not gram positive. So, again, what we're doing with these two augers, if we wanted to put these in our, our setup, this would, this would show us. See, because gram negatives and gram positive both can grow on blood auger. So, it's not a very good plate to say, oh, I think I have a gram positive organism, because you may have a gram negative organism, or you may have both, right? So we can use the other augers to kind of differentiate differences. So it takes out the negatives. So if I had a blood auger and I put a PEA up here and I looked at it, I go, well, the blood auger's growing and the PEA is growing and it basically looks like the same pattern that I struck on both of them. Then that tells you you probably got one organism, right? Or you can go to the PEA and go, well, it looks like I got one growing over here. But when I go back to the blood, I see what? I see two, right? I'd see my positive and something else. I'd see a negative on there. So when we set up plates, and this is where I think lab is a little misleading because you're going down there today and you're going, oh, I've got one growth, look at that. 
I got one organism over here, I got one organism over here, and that's not really true life in the micro lab. This micro lab, you usually get a plate, and you have more than one growing one. Okay. And depending on how it's brought to you, how it's collected, that might be the reason it's growing more than one. All right, and we go back to our big example of how does the nurse tell the patient we need urine in a cup. Here's your cup, go pee in the cup, All right? That's, that's the direction. Then nothing about clean catch, nothing about midstream catch. None of those are explained to the patient. It's here's a cup, go put some pee in it, and bring it back to me, and I got my job done. So then we in micro have to deal with that. We have to deal with the urine culture. And all we're using for urine culture is the blood auger. And then one we're gonna see with the gram negatives later called McConkie, okay? So mannitol salt is another really good one because what it does, it tells us that the staff can grow in high salt concentration. Remember we talked about that at the very beginning. We said, hey, these are, what was the word, halo, was that word we had early? Halo tolerance. Halo tolerance, right? Halo tolerance, meaning they can grow in high, high salt concentration. Mannitol salt also differentiates them if they ferment mannitol, which is a sugar. Okay, mannitol is sugar. We got salt auger, we got mannitol auger, and if it grows on this plate, then we know it's a mannitol fermenter and it also can grow in high salt. The beautiful thing about mannitol salt is, is that if staph is on it, okay, this is staph epi. And that's growing, which means it can grow on the salt, but there's no color change. So it's not fermenting the mannitol. It's growing because it's salt but it's not fermenting using mannitol as a source of energy. It's not fermenting that. Okay, so it doesn't change color. This is the color of mannitol salt, pink. Okay, it's a pink plate. So that's staph epi, so that's our negative. This is staph aureus. So the great thing about mannitol salt auger is, is that if you use it, with staph aureus, it turns it yellow where it's growing and it's obvious and you can't miss it. It's not something you're gonna have to need a microscope for. You can go, I oh, know I've got, I've got staph aureus, yay. Because it's growing not only on the mannitol, but it is fermenting the mannitol, right? So it's a very helpful plate. So when I set up a wound culture where I might suspect it's staph aureus in the wound, I use mannitol salt in that setup. So it doesn't, does it do the positive and negative? Or? Does it do the positive and negative? Yeah. Here? Yeah, so that would be positive? This or? would be positive for staph aureus. Okay. Yes, if your plate, you pull it out of the incubator at, after one night and it has this color change, that's staph aureus. So the that epi doesn't turn color. So it stays pink the next day. Stays pink the next day. You don't have any color. You don't, you don't have any bright yellow to welcome you to the day. There's other things we'll see. We're going to see the other plates, but this is a key plate to use. What about sapro? Does it change? No. Okay. No, staph aureus is the only one that will change color. Where are you getting the sample to put on the plate? Hmm? Where are you getting the sample to put on the plate? Our samples? Yeah, like from the one. From the one? Do you only check the, like if it has an infection or do you, do you do it with every one patient to make sure? Oh, you mean this? Yeah. Like this, when this? you spread it on the plate. Yeah, where did this come from? Yeah. Like in real hospital <laughs> work? Yeah. Okay, I thought you meant like downstairs in the lab. You say, well, I got it out of the freezer. And I followed it out, and then I had uh, Zach and Emily, they streaked the plates for you today. No, th this, yeah, this is a wound culture. It's probably a swab that's got bloody wound exudate on it, and then they hand you that, and then you put out your plates, and then you apply it to all these plates and streak for isolation and then put them in the incubator for the night. 
So our wound set up to be blood auger, okay? McConkie, because we don't know if it's gram negative or gram positive. We'll do PEA, we'll do mannitol salt, I'll do the chocolate auger, and then I'll do a thioglycolate liquid media at the end. Plus a gram stain at the beginning, okay? So I like to do that whole shooting match, okay? So what we're planning, with the, the great plan, is that when we get to the unknown, okay? When you get to your unknown part of micro, which is part of the lab, you're gonna get hopefully a set of how we would do, and we say, okay, you get a wound, you get a urine, and then you set it up that way, and then you have all that in front of you. That's what I wanna make sure that you can do at the end. And we're gonna do step by step to build up to that. So keep, that's what I'm saying, keep all these, like every one of these, like, hey, yeah. So we won't do this for a urine, okay? We're not, we're not doing that. Staph aureus in the urine is not a big, not a, not a usual spot. Okay, but in a wound, yeah. And so, the wounds usually present to an ER, if you work at ER, as spider bite. And that's, that's like, that's like number one reason I get a wound out of a, I mean, a, a staph aureus out of the ER is usually a spider bite comes in. It's not a spider bite, it's just a staph infection in the skin. It raises, it gets red, it looks like something bit you and it hurts, okay? So it's usually a staph skin infection. Is it, you said that you have to let it go overnight? Like yes. If someone comes in with a wound, they won't know anything until like the next day? Gram stain immediately. Yeah. Okay, so you take that swab. So then they'll get treated from that and then you'll know it. Usually else. they're, yeah, usually they're on top of an uh, antibiotic then. Mm -hmm. You know, they're giving them something. But then you don't know as we work it up. And that's hopefully what I, when I teach intro, that's one thing I like to show is how long it takes to work up a, a culture. Mm -hmm. Because Nursing doesn't always realize that, so they're pushing. They're like, where is that culture report? You know, we're, we don't have it, and they're going home, and we still don't have a culture report. Well, if they came in and got a dose of antibiotic and the doctor discharges them the next day, which is very likely, then of course, we're never going to have that ready. But they want to get that done before they, you know, they have their checklist of what all has to be in the chart before you can discharge. And usually cultures are still pending. So it takes a little while. I'm assuming that's another reason why lab personnel and nurses butt heads. That's one of the reasons, yeah. <laughs> and it's just because they, and you have to realize they do not know. They do not know how long it takes from the time it was submitted to the time you can finalize it. I mean, at the best, at the best, if it came in one day, it's two days before we report it. it at the best, okay? So the first day is growth overnight. The second day is set up for ID and sensitivity. So that, that's the best we can do is a three day, you know, turnaround or two day, a two day turnaround. Here's staff artists again. On mannitol salt auger. We also have um, staph aureus requires additional nutrients, and we're going to supply that staph aureus with chocolate auger. Okay, chocolate auger is not chocolate. Okay, it's not sugar and and uh, cocoa beans. No, it just has a brown look to it, so it gets the name chocolate. Don't eat it, please. Okay. Doesn't taste good. It is a media containing some isovitalex and metadion, dion, or dion. Okay, so there's stuff added. Let's just put it that way. They add that to the chocolate auger to help staph aureus grow. Okay. So the indications, if there's no growth on the blood auger, okay, but but you got gram positive cocci are seen on the gram stain. And the patient is receiving antibiotics. That's the key we're going to talk about right now. Especially if they have a chronic staph infection. Okay, we need to go to the chocolate auger plate. 
Because what has happened is, is the patient's on antibiotics. That antibiotic is transferred with any body fluid onto the plate, and it prevents growth. Okay, that antibiotic prevents the growth. Okay, so we would always need to put a chocolate auger in a wound setup just because this could be the reason. Right, we may not have really good growth on the blood auger, and we definitely will see the chocolate auger. And you're going to see a beautiful chocolate auger today with Staph aureus, and you, it's very unique. So you need to, you know, picture it, see it, because you'll see it again and again, but it picks up the golden look. So it, it, it's obvious when staff's on chocolate, staff aureus, put it that way, staff aureus. Don't let me confuse you by just saying staff. So chocolate auger is diff, a definite in the mix too. So we get this, we get uh, culture characteristics. We always do a gram stain on young cultures. Aging cultures may appear to be gram negative or gram variable. So, hey, don't feel bad about your gram staining the last week. We can just write it up as you had a, a, an old culture, but you didn't, but anyway. Colony macroscopic consists of opaque, smooth colonies. So if we look at the colonies, look at macroscopically and with your eye, and then we have one of these great words for microbiology, buterous, okay, which is soft and butter-like in consistency. So they have a little fluff to them. And they look like on chocolate, they're going to look like you've added some either vanilla coloring or butter. They look, they look buttery, okay? They look like you've added a little butter to them when they were baking in the incubator. So they're golden, yellow in color, but the key here is, is that we know it's Staph aureus because on the blood auger plate, they're beta hemolytic, which means beta hemolysis is happening. So the reason we put blood auger, blood, red blood cells into the auger is to see this. So they, as the staff grows, they will lyse the red cells in the auger, and they will make zones of clearing around them. So they look like, if you hold it up to the light when you get down there this afternoon, you're going to see beta hemolysis on one plate and not on the other, okay? And what you're going to see is the blood is disappearing out of the auger. The red blood cells are being lysed by the staph aureus's enzymes and it's lysing all the red cells that are in the auger. Beware though that all, all staph aureuses are not beta hemolytic, but you might have one that would be non-beta hemolytic staph. But that's our, this is one of those classic, right, classic morphologies that we're looking for. Staph epi is pale, gray, white, non-hemolytic. You'll see him downstairs today. And then Saprophyticus is usually white, but maybe a little yellowy or orangey. But you, you won't see um, hemolysis with him either. So this is what you'll see downstairs. You can see the zone around them almost looks golden. So beta hemolytic. Okay, and this is all lysine. This is lysine. So you can see that that, that red blood cell is is disappearing around the colony growth. A little closer view of, I think that's still the same lysine. It's harder to see when you get closer. That's better, see that. It's kind of the golden halo or the clear halos around these colonies. You won't miss it today, I promise. I've already checked them, they're doing really good. This is epi. Epi is not hemolyzing the red blood cells. Your staph epi downstairs is not quite as white as this one, but that's usually a great sign that you've got staph epi is the white, white colonies. You can see that, that these look about the same, but there's no hemolysis around them. This is saprophyticus on blood auger. Again, no hemolysis. 
more white staff. Here's that coagulase test. Yeah, we'd get to it eventually. So we need to differentiate our staffs from staph aureus, and this is what we do. We do a coagulase test. So coagulase is an enzyme which clots plasma. Okay. So that's just produced by staph aureus. And why would why would staph aureus want to clot your plasma? Anybody know? Anybody? Anybody? What, what might be in that plasma that Staph Aureus doesn't want to, do, to send, send their way? So if you clot it up, it can't get there. White blood cells, yeah, uh, antibodies, right? Antibodies of your own that would attach to it if it found it, right? So it's a, like a defense mechanism, again. So Staph aureus being the one pathogenic that we're really worried about has this coagulase. It's the only one that has coagulase. And we're going to do the screen test downstairs. We have Staph assault slide test. This traditional slide coagulase test. You're going to get to do that for screening for, for you today. Okay, so you'll get to do that with yours and see that if it's positive or negative. Um, and we'll do the slide. We don't do the tube coagulase test, but you could, okay? But we're just going to stay right here and, and do that. So we have that kit, and what we'll do is pass that kit around as you're working on setting up your API. So we have our API strips to set up for staff, and then we'll send around the coagulase test kit uh, to each table. That way you aren't moving and hovering uh, over the top of each other. Yes. Um, did you say that um, staff aureus was the only one that have a coagulase? Coagulase positive staph, yes. It differentiates it from epi and sacrificus. So remember, we got two so far. We have the catalase, right? That helps us determine whether we're dealing with staph or strep. And then we got now we got another one which is coagulase, which is going to tell us, hey, we got to the catalase positive side. And then we can do a coagulase to see if we have aureus or one of the other. So it's a real good test to do if you're confused or don't know uh, if you're dealing with staph aureus. But I'm giving you at least five different ways to tell that you have staph aureus so far. This is what it's going to look like. You're going to have a slide. You're going to put that on there, and it's going to clump up, okay? Because we're using an anticoagulase antibody in our test kit, and it will bind and glutinate, basically a glutination, uh, and clump up. And that's our negative that we'll have downstairs. And you'll have that slide new today. That's the tube. You know, it's saying it's you know, it's flowing or not flowing. Tube test would be, you know, it's coagulase there, it's gonna clot. If it's not, remember coagulase and the enzyme that clots plasma. Okay. So that's easy enough. And you can't tell what that means. But yeah, that, that's clotted and that's probably not since it has the meniscus growing down. And it's a latex agglutination test. We're gonna talk plenty more about this in immunology but it's a latex particle coated with plasma and IgGs. The test requires less than 30 seconds, okay? If it is a positive reaction, we can, other tests that we can do is mannitol fermentation. We've seen that with our mannitol salt. We have some others. We, we deal a little bit with DNAs, uh, not very much. And then thermo, uh, thermonuclease test, I'm gonna stick with the ones we talk about, okay? Manitol, but just know those are there. Coagulase negative staff are usually negative, but are occasionally positive for manitol or DNA or thermonuclease test. So that's just kind of a little warning there. They're usually negative for the other determinants, but they may not be. So your go-to is the, the coagulase test.
Again, we're doing the staphylocide latex and gluten test. This will be a positive, that's a negative. Okay, so here is some of our testing coming up. This is how we determine when you set up your API strip today. Okay, uh, some of the things that we're going to see with, with these are we can look at um, identification of what is CNS? What is that? What's CNS? There you go. Coagulation negative stat. I didn't want to leave that hanging. Anybody hanging out right there and didn't know what that was. So we can do some conventional tests that include nitrate reduction. So we're going to see a nitrate well in our API strip. Okay. And, and the, the old, I'm going to say old, I'll say we used to teach this with tubes, test tubes, and we would put the chemical reaction in the test tubes and you'd see the color change and when you added your sample and incubated them overnight. So we, we're, we've, gone, we've gone high tech today. We got a little test strip that has about 20 wells, maybe 20 wells going across it. And you're going to load, you're going to make up a suspension first of your organism. And then you're going to load your wells with that organism. Okay, and they're going to get in those wells and there's going to be some things there for the organism to grow and react with and change colors depending on what the organism is producing. Okay, and then come back Thursday, we'll read those. We're going to read those results and key them in and get our identification done. And we did it, right? That's the goal of the week. But some tests that we can do is nitrate reduction an alkaline phosphatase reaction, arginine dehydrolase, urease, homolysis, NOVA biosin susceptibility, carbohydrate fermentation. So that test strip is going to have some or all of these. You know, it's going to have different ones. And then you can get them commercially available. And then these coagulase negative staff species are only identified if they are from normally sterile sites like blood, cerebral spinal fluid. So what does that mean? Okay, we'll go back to think about our staph epi. Don't forget about staph epi. What did I tell you about staph epi? There's this gray area of staph epi. Staph epi is not supposed to be in the blood, the cerebral spinal fluid. But we may ID it there. So there's that gray area that if you get a staph epi out of a blood culture, do you report it? Okay. So that's the gray. And that's tough because usually it's like, ah, that's the one I'm going to use to determine how many skin contaminants I have in blood culture collection. So when you say, can I report it? The reason we draw blood cultures in pairs, right, two sets, is because if staph epi shows up here, but not here, then we probably got a skin contaminant from the first stick. If staph epi shows up here, you know, probably say, well, what's there? And here, then we may have a staph epi in the blood. And that can happen. But not very likely, but there is the possibility. But if it's let's pick on, let's pick on, let's pick on, let's pick on. Uh, I'll pick on Tristan. Tristan. Tristan's the phlebotomist, and Tristan's not a very good phlebotomist, and everybody in the hospital knows Tristan's not a very good phlebotomist. Tristan is one that drew both sets of blood cultures. Tristan has a positive infection or skin contaminant of 50% flip a coin, whether he's going to get a good blood culture or a bad one, okay? But let's say Josh draws. Josh is considered very good for bottoms. Josh's contamination rate is 1%, maybe even low, lower than that. Josh never contaminates a blood culture. So you can use that. So I would use all that information and just run. If it's I saw Tristan's name on it, I'd just say skin contaminant. If I saw Josh's name on it, I'd say, Doc, we got a positive blood culture, staph epi, I don't know how, it must have been during surgery, 
but that's it's in the blood. Okay. So that's how we get through maybe make a critical call based on what we know of who's drawing, who's not drawing. And as I hope they told you in phlebotomy training, it all begins with you. So our work means nothing if the phlebotomist goofs up. What are the most common ways that the phlebotomist can cause that? I'm tired of wiping down arms. I don't want to, I'm just not even going, you know, I don't use alcohol. I don't use chloroprep. I don't scrub the time it says to scrub it. I don't, yeah, I got a cart full of that stuff. I don't use it. All I do is put a cotton ball in there and go, that full bottom. Yeah. Just not following the procedure. Okay. That's the one. Not that that's Tristan, but it's easy to just put his name on that. Okay. All right. So we move into clinical significance. I think we've covered a lot of this already, so this shouldn't be, oh, we got some problems now. This shouldn't be, but skin infections, staph aureus, folliculitis, infection of the hair follicle. This is that, that's that spider bite, okay? That's that red, swollen, got a head on it, almost looks like an ant bite, but gosh, it's hurting that. Something had to bite me. Uh, fur uncles, the infection spreads into the subcutaneous tissue and becomes a boil. Never want to boil, right? So that's staph aureus moving and getting bigger. But there are serious invasive infections. It could move into the blood, bacteremia. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause bone infections, osteomyelitis. It can cause heart infections endo or myocarditis and these rarely occur in healthy individuals but it, you know we don't want to cause them just because somebody's having issues this could be the reason they die on us they usually occur in patients whose immune system's been compromised and i don't know if you saw the big report monday was it monday the big report over the weekend and, and just i'll just throw it out there and y'all can do whatever you want to do with it only 6% of all COVID patients are dying of COVID only. That means 94% have underlying issues. Okay. Just thought I'd say that. So you can take that how you want to take it. But this is who we need to watch for. Okay. So if we're drawing blood cultures in a cancer unit, if we're drawing blood cultures on a little lady that just had chemo, we don't need to be careless. We need to be cautious. We need to make sure we're not introducing staph aureus anyway to them. Okay. Uh, injury to intact skin, viral infections. These are the predisposing issues. Leukocyte defects, whether it be leukemias, lymphomas, humoral immunity deficiencies, meaning our antibodies are deficient, complement is deficient, Foreign bodies such as sutures or pacemakers can be introducing staph to when they put them in. And then antibiotics to which staph aureus is resistant there at the very bottom, which we know it's methicillin, right? It's MRSA where it gets its name. So we have some pictures. I don't know if your uh, stomach is ready for these. But we have that's our boil or our, uh, you know, skin oozing. We have a, an abscess, can't really see that very well. I just see blood. Another abscess. Uh, sutures, post operative infection. That looks pretty good. That doesn't look very infected, but. All right, that's our pneumonia. The staph aureus has moved into the lungs, causing the pneumonia. Never a good thing. You know, these little creatures, which are cockroaches, they can be a vector, meaning they can bring it around. We have some more stuff. So this is the pathogenicity, right? Toxigenic diseases, non-invasive disease due to the production of an enterotoxin or an exotoxin. Food poisoning. Okay. 
Ingestion of contaminated food, uh, scalded skin syndrome, epidermis, uh, epidermis peels off, exposing the dermis. We've seen that, it's scalded skin syndrome. Here's our impetigo for Heather. She was wanting to see impetigo, there it is. A localized form of scalded skin syndrome, a blister filled with pus, rupturing, makes kind of a crusty black look to it. Okay, so we see that could be issues with that. The scalded skin syndrome, I, I, I mean, I don't know if, if you've ever had scalded skin syndrome. I had, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was a staph, but I think it was just high fever. Anybody ever had a real high fever and then like a couple of days later, your hands peeled? Nobody? Is it just me? Yeah, I was a freshman in high school and got chicken pox and I had a real high fever and I just remember like later, I just, like a glove, I took this layer of skin and just peeled off like a glove off my hand because it kind of, I guess the high fever kind of did the skin like Staph aureus would. There's some infantigo. Um, I worked at summer camp one summer. That's, that's, mine were little black spots all over their skin from mosquito bites. We also get toxic shock syndrome, staph aureus. Hmm, y'all knew that, did you? You've heard of toxic shock syndrome, right? Okay, staph aureus, most often seen women of bare childbearing age, associated with the use of tampons, and that is the classic description. Okay, the bloody absorbent, material is perfect for staph aureus to find and grow. It is, as they say, bacteria love wet, moist, and dark areas. Okay, they love to thrive in those conditions. As organisms grow, it elaborates a toxin, which is absorbed into the bloodstream, high fever, low blood pressure, malaise and confusion, Wrap it into a stupor coma or multi organ multi organ failure, and then we're in trouble. Okay, it's often a rash seen early, resembles a sunburn uh, around the uh, lips, mouth, eyes, palms, and soles. And if you survive the initial phase of infection, the rash the rash has a desquamates or peels off after ten to fourteen days. So that's what I was talking about with mine, but just trying to give you some ideas. So toxic shock syndrome from a staph aureus being introduced and harbored until it ends up in the blood. That's a rash. Anytime there's a rash, you gotta worry. Well, that's staph aureus, how we do it. Make it, make it through those slides, nobody and I didn't warn you about the slides. Some of you probably already knew we were having slides, but I don't ever warn you because anybody ever taken like a paramedic class? First responder class? Nobody? Well, I used to think, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good, right? But in class, I was sitting there and the, 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 it was an, a paramedic. He came in and said, now I'm fixing to show you some slides. Said, Great, right? And some of you might need to turn away. Some of you might not need can look at these without feeling like you're going to pass out. So the whole time, what was I doing? My heart racing. Am I getting lightheaded? Am I going to pass? Am I going to embarrass myself and fall out of my chair because I can't handle looking at these? So I don't warn you for that reason. But we do have some really gruesome slides sometimes. So you can look away, or you can tell me, "Oh, you know, I'm not going to look." But we made it. Nobody's passed out, so that's good. Um, that's why I didn't warn you about some ugly slides. So here's our coagulation negative staff, and this is everybody but who? Staph aureus. So we can still get staph epidermidis to cause issues. Prosthetic heart valve causing endocarditis, a cerebral spinal shunt causing an infect. Anytime we introduce something through the skin, Bacteremia, 70 to the 90% of the cases occur in the needle, natal intensive care unit. Saprophyticus, 
urinary tract infections. Okay, and this Saprophyticus is resistant to Novobiosin, while other staphs are susceptible to it. So I told you we were going to bring in the antibiotic picture, right? So if we have Novobiosin on our antibiotic chart or our antibiotic panel that we're looking at, one thing we can do with Saprophyticus is do what? We can check to see if it's resistant to Novobiosin. The other should be sensitive to Novobiosin. Is the bacteremias when, um, I guess the baby's born and they automatically before then give the mom an antibiotic or something for that? This would be a sick baby in the neonatal intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say staph epi being introduced through an IV, through blood draw. Still wouldn't be from having the baby. It could be from staph epi through the canal, maybe, but I, no. But if we got if we got a positive blood culture on a baby in the neonatal unit, it's probably going to be staph epi. That's what that's saying, Nine, almost ninety percent of the time. Oh, has anybody heard of this staph? Lug, Dunasus, anybody? Anybody throwing that out there? It's one of the coagulase negative staphs. It's part of the normal skin pore, commonly colonizing the perineal region, perineal region. It causes a severe infection like staph aureus, especially acute endocarditis, prosthetic and, and native valve, so it goes to the heart. Okay? And it sets up on the heart valves. It causes soft tissue. It's primary growing at the MMA. Uh, other infections such as osteomyelitis, peritonitis, intravat. So we may see this one. You know, if we got something, an issue, it would probably be in a blood culture, if I was guessing. Uh, but it has been found on the skin and soft tissue. But I was just wondering if y'all had heard of this one yet. It's kind of one of those, and the story continues with Lugdumius. All right, back to some virulence factors as we work our way down. So we're on the back page, right? Virulence factors. Hemolysis. Lysins, hemolysins for staph aureus, that's how they, they produce those to, to lice red and white blood cells. So it does both, right? This hemolysins. It also has leukocytin, which lysins white blood cells. So again, what are these? Virulence factors are how you avoid the immune system. So we've got a little crossover between our two classes. Just, just a touch, so don't freak out if you're not in immunology. Enterotoxins, food poisoning again, produced by the staph aureus. Exfoliatin, which is responsible for that scalded skin syndrome. So it exfoliates. My hand was really smooth after that, though. I mean, you peel off a good hunk of epidermis like that. It was kind of reddish, but it was still like, wow, it's like baby skin. That's what it felt like. So those are virulence factors for staph aureus. Oh, here's our big, big one. Save this one for almost last. I'm getting close to the end, but methicillin. Methicillin is used to treat penicillin resistant strains, okay? So we start off, penicillin, yay, we love it, right? For years, we had penicillin, ate penicillin, the street got a staph infection, take penicillin, okay? But most, it says most strains of staph aureus are resistant to penicillin these days because where, where did staph aureus begin again? Where did it start? Where was the only place you could get it? Remember? Started the lecture with it. Hospital. Hospital, right? What? Why, you know. Every patient in the hospital probably got penicillin when they were in there, when they went through surgery, got to give them an antibiotic, get us, give it, give it, give it, right? So then the staph aureus became resistant, right? Again, a survival mechanism, 
and we're going to talk more about how that works later, but it became resistant, okay? So then we gave methicillin because they were resistant to penicillin, but now Staph aureus has become methicillin resistant. So what do we do now? Anybody had a staph infection lately? We just roll up vancomycin on them now. What's eventually going to happen? It's going to form resistance to vancomycin. And then we're in deep doo doo, right? Sorry, my French. Right? Because we've, we've done, we know what, what's happening. We know that we're treating, but that's when I say MRSA and the patient's in the, on the floor. Next thing the doctor's ordered is let's start vancomycin. Okay. Yeah. That, it, it'll it's work. Huh? Does it ever like lose resistance where if you do methicillin for so long, you can go back to penicillin? No, is that strain that the strain that has the resistance has it's it's that's its genetic. It's it's changed genetically. Do we still see regular staff? Oh yeah. Staph aureus that's not methicillin? Yeah. I don't know if that's your question, but yeah, I still see regular staph aureus. Not staph met, not MRSA. Tell me another difference. Well, we have a, a little well. We have a little well in our antibiotics called oxacillin, and that's methicillin's name in the real world. I'm, I'm not going to get into the ox and meth right now, but it'll be resistant to that. One will be resistant to that, and the other one won't. Test yeah, we put oh, that, we, we're going to do that downstairs, not today, but we have an antibiotic panel that we're going to load, it's called a combo plate, we're going to see them over to the side, we've got them in it. We're going to load the organism in there, and if it grows the next day, then it's resistant to that antibiotic. If it doesn't grow in that well, it's sensitive. So yeah, we're going to do this. The reason it can do that is called a MEC A gene. So you're going to introduce this term, this gene. You remember we said this gene gets transferred over to another organism. It leads to the production of an altered penicillin binding protein, which keeps penicillin from binding, and basically. The beta-lactam antibiotic lacks sufficient affinity for the altered penicillin binding protein which confers resistance to all beta-lactam antibiotics, including penicillin, cephalosporin, and carbanapine, car carpanapine. Who wants to help me with that? Carbanapine. Say it louder so I might hear. Oh, that was good. Whoever said it was great. Who said it? Great. Can everybody hear that? I know she has a mask on. So we treat these with non-beta-lactam antibiotics, such as vancomycin. Vancomycin is the drug of choice for MRSA, MRSA, whichever way you want to say it. I'll take either one. Okay. So this was kind of this antibiotic resistance comes in. So this is key to your knowledge base on when we get to the antibiotic resistant. It's going to be conferred by the MAC A gene in the staph aureus, alters the penicillin binding protein. Penicillin binds to cell walls and punches holes in them, okay? It deteriorates the cell wall and the bacteria die. Okay, so penicillin's great for who? Gram positive, okay? So we get this beta-lactam antibiotics, which this is where I want you to kind of circle these. Circle them, let's say I got penicillin, I got cephalosporins. What was it again? Car yeah, I'm not sure. Carbapenems. Okay, carbapenems. This organism now we need to be treated with a non-beta-lactam antibiotic, which is vancomycin. Okay, so there's a lot of good stuff on that slide, but you're probably at this point in the lecture, you're like, God, we just quit, right? Please stop. You're giving us way too much. I have a question. Yes. Okay, it might be dumb, but Never MR done. MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Yes. Okay, just making sure. Sorry, that's it. Yes. 
This is a key slide. This is for today and the whole rest of the semester. You need to know this slide. This isn't the same thing as MRSA, right? Yeah, that is. Sorry, MRSA. MRSA is just that's my way of saying okay. MRSA. You'll hear it called MRSA, okay. even though it doesn't have an E in between the M and the R. It is MRSA. Yeah. MRSA is the same. It's a, it's all it's said different by different people. I'd always heard it called MRSA or MRSA, but I never knew what it actually stood for. Yes. Okay. Got it. Methicillin resistant staph aureus. Very good. All right. Central nervous. No, that's not central nervous. What is CNS again? Coagulates negative staph include many multiple resistant strains, and they're difficult to treat, as you can imagine, too. Here's our, uh, some of our susceptibility testing. We can plate it out and put our antibiotics on a little disc and see the zone of clearing. And is this my last slide? Almost, almost, yeah. Let's do this last slide. Uh, So all of a sudden we throw in micrococcus here at the end. <laughs> Catalase positive. All right, we know that that sends us our staph way, but there's micrococcus. Gram positive coccine clusters, they're non-pathogenic. Okay. And I'm just gonna leave that there. We we can talk a little bit about that Toxo A. Taxo A is a, a vast trace, and we'll talk more about them later. We'll just leave that there with micrococcus. We'll see a couple of pictures of the micrococcus. And that's micrococcus growing on a blood auger. Okay, I'm good. That's right on time, right? Don't forget the micrococcus. Got one little paragraph. All right, so now we're going to stop sharing. Got chat. Obligate, yes. Lauren, thank you for that. And then we will end the meeting and see everybody in lab this afternoon.